Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach, when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars <coughs> grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of the birds but all their songs grow faint, when people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him, before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Sam, uh, pastor here, if uh, you don't know me. Uh, it'd be great to keep that passage open. We're also looking at chapter two a little bit of Ecclesiastes today. Um, but let me pray as we think through God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it gives us truth. Uh, we pray that as we think about it now, and we reflect on the life and the example of our late queen, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, by your spirit, for your glory alone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the, uh, Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth, the second said in a 2016 Christmas uh, address, this, I think it's on the screen, uh, Jesus Christ lived obscurely for most of his life and never traveled far. He was maligned and rejected by many, though he had, do had done no wrong. And yet billions of people now follow his teachings and find in him the guiding light for their lives. I am one of them because Christ's example helps me see the value of doing small things with great love. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen, uh, the longest reigning British monarch of over 70 years. Uh, she was important enough to warrant two birthdays each year. Uh, respected enough to be the only person in Britain to be allowed to drive on public roads without a driving license. The only person in Britain to be allowed to travel the world without a passport. Privileged enough to own her first house at just six years old in the grounds of the largest royal palace in all of the world, Windsor Castle. Unique enough to own an elephant two giant turtles, a jaguar, not the car type, although she's probably got plenty of those, and two sloths, all gifts from world leaders. Humorous enough that on uh, one low key trip to Scotland, she was walking in a walking gear with one security guard also in his walking gear and two American tourists bumped into her and they asked her, do you live locally? <laughs> I can't do an American accent, sorry. And she said, yes, I have a house nearby. <laughs> And when they asked if, that she, if she had ever met the Queen, she smiled and said, no, but he has. <laughs> uh, intelligent enough to have studied constitutional history and law, as well as theology with, with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Elegant enough to have dresses and clothes designed and made personally for her. Worthy enough uh, that she had servants and staff at all of her residences. Uh, she even has her own poet, significant enough to be uh, essential in forming governments and uh, installing 15 prime ministers in the UK. Confident enough to have visited 150 country, sorry, 150 foreign uh, visits and 100 different countries in her lifetime. Practical enough that she was able to repair and drive military vehicles 
during World War II. Hard working enough that on average, she did more than 300 royal engagements every single year of her 70 year reign. Admired enough to have sat, and this must have taken time, for over 130 portraits of herself. Popular enough to have received 70,000 letters a year. Eloquent enough to have been making speeches that the world listens to. And she made her first radio broadcast at just 14. Powerful enough to be controlling 28 billion pounds worth of royal assets and has a personal fortune of 500 million pounds. Influential enough that millions and millions of people have looked up to her for over 70 years. Oh, we could go on, couldn't we? Every privilege, every honor, every authority, every material need, great wisdom and knowledge, all at her beck and call. All of this has rested on Her Majesty's shoulders for her whole life. All that the world has to offer in her hands. And who does she admire and seek to model her life upon? Jesus Christ, who lived an obscure life, never traveled far, who was maligned and rejected by many, though he had done no wrong. And yet she says, I am one of his followers. It seems odd, doesn't it, to follow a maligned and a rejected man when you have so much. Uh, here at Grace Church, we've been uh, starting a new sermon series in Ecclesiastes. And the headline phrase that keeps repeating itself is, everything is meaningless. Uh, if you've got your Bibles out, it's on the screen. Flip back to chapter one. Uh, chapter one of Ecclesiastes, verse two, says this. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher or the, the author of this book. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Uh, the passage we're going to look at uh, a little bit later today, uh, <coughs> sorry, the passage we were going to look at today, but we've moved to next week so that we could think uh, more about Queen Elizabeth today, uh, finds the teacher in this book, the author, searching, if you like, for the meaning of life. We were going to look at chapter two. We're going to re refer to it a bit now, so you can look at chapter two if you want. He looks for uh, the meaning to life through achievements and through wisdom and through knowledge, through pleasures through material things. Uh, I'm gonna read some of chapter two and his achievements don't sound too dissimilar to that description I just gave of the queen's life and her reign. Although the teacher seems to be a bit more immoral than our queen, don't draw that conclude, that, uh, that link as I read. So Ecclesiastes chapter two, verses four to 10. This was his search for meaning. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit and trees in them. I made reservoirs uh, to water groves uh, to uh, flourishing trees. I brought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart, no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor and this was the reward of all my toil. It's not a dissimilar description to all that was available and at the hands of our queen. But verse 11, chapter two, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, a breath doesn't last. Nothing was gained under the sun. Uh, the teacher knows that whatever we seek after in this life makes no difference in the light of our death. He was wise enough to see that life lived now 
with no thought for the unavoidable realities of death that is to come, is no life at all. In fact, it's meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. You just can't grab it. Uh, he's tried, uh, instead of pleasures, to pursue great wisdom and knowledge. Also, in, uh, this is the end of chapter one. But all he discovered is, for uh, chapter one, verse 18, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Wisdom and knowledge does not find meaning and comfort. It makes you more of a, aware of pain in life. So ultimately, the teacher says, uh, chapter two, verse 18 and 19, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. It's done nothing really for me. And who knows whether the person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. <laughs> I don't think it's so much a discredit on those that are to follow that receive our inheritance, uh, more of a, how has, how, how has all I've amassed and worked for and looked for this meaning? How, what has that achieved for my life? Well, nothing. I'm just going to die and someone else is going to benefit from all my hard work. All the Queen's life achievements, all her work, all of her wisdom are, in a sense, meaningless in light of her death. And it will be the same for you and I, won't it? All that we've worked for and strived after and lived our life, life for will, in a sense, be meaningless in our death. And I think the Queen understood this tension of life. Uh, her Majesty demonstrated it when she spoke not of her achievements and her privileges, but always spoke of her duty and her service. Her joy was her work that she did under God not the things she achieved for herself. Because the things you achieve for yourself are meaningless. And so we have to find joy in our work for the Lord. In effect, she was always living in the light of her death. That is how she lived. She knew it was coming. Being the most powerful person in our country, to whom all citizens are, are literally too bow before, she still bowed herself to the almighty king of all. Why? Because she lived in preparation for her death. She knew what had meaning. She knew that all she had achieved on earth was meaningless if when she died, she faces God's judgment and all she had achieved just gets passed on to someone else. It is extraordinary to have so much and yet live with that wisdom and knowledge. That's why she says Jesus motivated and inspired her, not her own potential or her own achievements. She was humble enough to know that the God of this universe will not welcome her into heaven because she simply says, well, I'm the queen of England. But rather, even she, like us, needs a savior, a savior king. Uh, we had this quote in the video, I think, uh, but this is from another of her Christmas speeches. And she says this, history teaches us, just, just look around, she says, teaches us we need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness or our greed, or both. God sent into the world neither a philosopher or a general, but a saviour with the power to forgive. Uh, we don't need philosophers to give us more wisdom, as important as they are, she says, or generals to fight battles and to destroy worldly enemies for us, as important as they are for us. We need a saviour with the power to forgive. Uh, to embrace that truth changes lives. It, it changes everything about how we think and we live and we act. We no longer strive after our own worldly crowns or power or comfort or wealth or health or relationships. We now strive after uh, humbling ourselves before our God, our Savior, with the power to forgive. And the woman with more than any of us could ever imagine to have chose that. 
we're not, we do not live for our own achievements or in our own strength, but we live instead for the achievement of Jesus, the Savior with the power to forgive, who gave his life in exchange for us, who died at the hands of people like you and me, and yes, even our Queen. Those who have not lived fully and perfectly or, uh, and truly for the Holy One, the Lord God, but who have instead built their own kingdoms and rejected him. But with the help of God, we too, with so much less to lose than the Queen, can bow to the eternal throne of God, ask for his forgiveness for our rebellion against him, and he, through his son Jesus, who pays the price of our sin through his own death, will we find a saviour with the power to forgive. That's living in the light of our certain death. Uh, the passage Claire read for us uh, a while before, uh, also from the book of Ecclesiastes, it was actually the passage read at the Queen Mother's funeral. Uh, it's a call to the nation, to you and I here today, to live life with our death in mind. When the most powerful woman in all of the world dies, it's a wake-up call, isn't it? That we're not as significant as we think. Life is short. We are small. It's a call to use our one earthly life now not in meaningless pursuits, but for the only hope this world has. Uh, have a look at chapter 12, verse 1, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach, when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. A creator, that, that is a underestimated and glorious title for our God. It predefines the whole reason that he is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. For all is his, for he created all. There can be no question. If he created all, he is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. He is the creator. And our teacher writes, remember your creator in your youth. In other words, now. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. We don't remember God when it's too late. But now, when you're young, some of us may not be so young, but we remember him now, before the trappings of this life or before, as the teacher goes on to explain, we, we, we get older and we, we come into troubles and, and health and death comes our way. Before we have a life full of regrets, remember the creator. Do it today, he says. While the, the present events and, and hearing his word read to us today, while those spur us on to see the meaningless of this life around us without God as our saviour. Remember your creator now. Verse 2 of chapter 12. Remember him before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the, remain, after the rain. Or think of yourself like a great old house, he says in decline. Think of it, it wasting away. Verse 3. Remember your creator now. Not, verse 3, when the keepers of the house tremble. And the strong men stoop when the grinders cease because they are few. And those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of the birds, but all their songs grow faint. It's sad but relatable, isn't it? As age increases, our activity reduces. The grinding of grain is no longer heard. People rise with the sound of the birds but the songs grow faint, uh, probably an image of our hearing starting to go as we, we hear them as we wake and I uh, can't hear them anymore. Uh, we've seen our queen age with great dignity, haven't we? But for the little we have seen, 
we must know that she has aged and slowed far more than we've been privy to see. Her song grew faint, as ours will too. Remember your creator now, says the teacher, before it's too late. Or verse five, remember him uh, before people are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire, and desire no longer is stirred. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go to the streets. As an image, I think of in age, we become afraid of a fall or the jostle of the streets. Uh, it becomes too much or the almond tree with its dark leaves turns to a very pale gray blossom. And so does our hair, if we have any. Uh, our joints stiffen and we're, we're compared to a grasshopper that can barely be bothered to drag itself along anymore. <coughs> Uh, people we know have uh, and loved have passed away. They enter eternity and we're left here to go about the streets and to mourn. Just as the queen had done for her husband. And we do today for our queen. Or perhaps uh, it's, the own, uh, it's the teacher's own death that he has in mind uh, as he writes this. Either way, it's a difficult time. Getting old, death is scary, it's difficult. Remember him. He's your only hope. Verse six, remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well. Remember the creator. It only takes one link of that silver chain for the golden lamp bowl to smash to the ground. Our life is fragile. As we observe, as we see all things around us, mechanical things fail and break and shatter. Remember the creator. Verse seven. And the dust returns to the ground it came from. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. Uh, they're famous words, aren't they? Uh, the dust from which our creator created the first human, Adam, is returned to the dust. And our eternal spirit is left to face God, our creator. What will we say to him? I look at all my achievements, look at my wealth, look at all my wisdom and my hard work. Look how good I am. Not even the queen of England would dare to say such words to her creator. She knows, as we all know in our hearts, verse 8, that it's meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. They do not earn us salvation. No, the queen says, as she meets the Lord God, I am your humble, unworthy servant. Don't look what I have achieved. Look at what my saviour, with the power to forgive, has achieved. He is a saviour with the power to forgive. In him is the only meaning in this life when we reach the end. He is our creator God come down, not as a philosopher to advise us, not as a general to lead our armies, to defeat worldly enemies. Jesus is the savior God with the power to forgive. Every regret that we may have can be laid at his feet. Every selfish and impure thought, every mistake and shameful act, every pain and anguish that wrenches our hearts, laid at the feet of the Savior with the power to forgive. He is our creator God. He is the meaning that lasts in this life. And we may choose to live life our own way. Uh, we can dismiss all that we've read and heard from Ecclesiastes today. Or we can neglect the Queen's example, her humility to bow to the one true King. But death will catch us all up, is the message of this book. And heaven does not wait, uh, sorry, await those who reject the Saviour Jesus. Instead, eternal and right judgment for our rebellion awaits. That's why this, the pursuit of all else is meaningless. We need a savior with the power to forgive. Remember our creator today. 
And when death comes knocking, Jesus will be there with his hand out to draw us into eternal glory with him. I don't really like it when people uh, comment on what the Queen must have thought and how this must have meant that. It's quite hard to know, isn't it? But if she's a, a true believer, she uh, expressed through her life and through the things that she said, then I have no doubt that she would like her greatest legacy to not be one of pomp and glory, uh, not one of kind and good words about all that she's done and how great she was, however true, not one of riches and wisdom and achievements, but I think she'd like her legacy to be one of a humble and repentant people, turning to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness and true hope. For us all to bow before the Lord Jesus and to serve him alone as she example, set the example for us. A legacy, if you like, where she is less and the Lord Jesus, our Saviour King, is much more. If you like, remember the Creator, our Saviour with the power to forgive before we remember the Queen. Let me pray. Another quote from the Queen. To what greater inspiration and counsel can we turn than to the imperishable truth to be found in this treasure house, the Bible? Father, thank you for your word that reminds us that in this life, we have no hope outside of our Savior with the power to forgive. If we've been away from you, or forgotten you, or never once bowed before you in humble repentance, may you bring us back to the foot of the cross to lay down our sins and our woes and our trials and our misery. May we all live for your glory and your glory alone. Let us not strive after our own achievements, but may we strive after humble service and work for you. May we cling on to the Saviour, not to ourselves. We thank you deeply for the example of our Queen, who had everything in this life, yet chose you. We ask that you'd help us to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.